Good afternoon, everybody. Would you stand and sing this song with us? Great is thy faithfulness. Let's get the words up there. Okay. It, you have different words than I do. I apologize. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. to the ordination service 2020 for the churches of Christ and Christian Union it's so great to have each one of you here and for those that have joined us online thank you for joining let us pray our Heavenly Father we thank you for the fact that we can be here for this purpose we're celebrating the call of God on the life of individuals we're celebrating the fact that they have finished and spent time together serving you. For some, it's the beginning of ministry. For others, it's a time that they've finished their classes and work. Holy Spirit, may in every part of this service we yield to you. May we trust that you are here. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, in the blessed Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. The purpose of this sacred worship gathering is to officially recognize the call of God on the lives of men and women to preach the gospel and to devote themselves to service in the kingdom of Christ. It is a service both of sacredness and celebration. This is also a service for all ministers to review his or her consecration to God's call to ministry. For the laity, Christian believers, this is a service for you to consecrate yourself to support those whom God has called.
In the first two chapters of the book of 1 Samuel, we find it recorded that this was a dark time in the nation of Israel. The first two chapters concern the woman Hannah and her husband and her desire to have a child and the deep cry and longing of her heart which she poured out to God. These chapters also concern the Eli, who is the high priest, and his sons, who did not take seriously their role in leadership in the nation of Israel and the worship of the people. And this conflict, these conflicting values, all came to a head as God revealed His plan in the life of the young man named Samuel when he answered the prayer of Hannah and called Samuel to his service. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called to Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. And he went and lay down. Again the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And a third time the Lord called Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go and lie down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. If 
Would you stand, please, and sing this with me? Call. At this time, Dr. Holbrook, on behalf of the General Board of Examination and Ordination, I certify that this class of individuals has met the requirements for ordination in the Churches of Christ and Christian Union. They have completed the course of study and they have met the requirements of experience. They have served our churches and have preached and or taught the word of God in keeping with this high and holy calling. They have been examined by the General Board of Examination and Ordination and have given evidence of their qualifications of the Christian ministry. This board has recommended each of these individuals to receive ordination in the Churches of Christ in Christian Union. I would like at this time to read their names and for those individuals to stand. Nick Adams, Daniel Coy, David Great from the Northeast District will be receiving his ordination at the Northeast District Council in October. Ann A. Jenkins, also from the Northeast District, receiving her ordination in October at their council. Aaron Long, Moore McKay, Joseph L. McCoon, Crystal Spriggs, you as our ordinance today have uh, studied hard, and I just appreciate your perseverance and your diligence to be at this place today. 
It's a little different in some years past and hopefully in the years to come. But you are here and as we are spread out, you are ordained no less. And God has placed his hand upon you to minister in the churches of Christ and Christian Union. We're proud of that fact. Our expectation is that you will follow the Great Commission as well as the Great Commandment to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. In the room a little while ago, you received a bust of John Wesley. And our doctrine, I know you will follow through with, and you will preach that diligently and faithfully. We love you, and we want to be available for you as you are available to us. And just thank you for all that you've done at this time. I have some questions that I I want to ask, and just answer those questions accordingly. Do you believe that God has called you to this life and work of an ordained minister? Do you believe in a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you persuaded that the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments contain all things necessary for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ and are the unique and authoritative standard for the church's faith in life? Will you be faithful in prayer, in the study of the Holy Scriptures, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, continually rekindle the gift of God that is in you? Will you do your best to pattern your life in accordance with the teachings of Christ, seeking to live a life of holiness that reflects the character of our Lord? Will you faithfully proclaim the message of heart holiness and Christ likeness, exhorting people to continually experience the transformational grace of God? Will you proclaim the message of deliverance from the power and pollution of sin? Will you be loyal to the churches of Christ and Christian Union, accepting its order, doctrine, and discipline? defending it against all doctrines contrary to God's holy word, and committing yourself to be accountable to those serving with you and to those who are appointed to supervise your ministry. And may God, who has given you the will to do these things, give you grace to perform them, that the work begun in you may be brought to perfection. Spouses, would you please be seated? Or standing, excuse me. (laughs) Will you please stand? (laughs) And congregation, I think it's here. Can we just say this, that we're going to be backing them and supporting them? Just read this together. We ask your blessing, O God, on each one making this covenant. Amen. Amen. This time, Brian Arner will be um, having a special song. And then Dr. Case is going to come and give us a message. I wanted to just share with you this that Dr. Case has served 50 years as a professor at Ohio Christian University. And I can't think of anybody else I'd rather speak in this service. So give these two your attention today. God bless you. So 
Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. Good to see each of you. Thank you that some of you taken your mask off and we can see each other and <laughs> recognize one another. I want to thank Dr. Holbrook and the General Ordination Board for extending to me the opportunity to share in this ordination service. I have uh, had a small part to play in the training of uh, many of these students and I count it a personal joy to be able to celebrate with them this afternoon in their ordination. As I was sitting here going through my mind, 1974, Beulah Grove Camp up at St. Mary's, Ohio, my ordination service almost 50 years ago. And uh, it's still a high point in my life. And I trust it will be for you as well. We're talking about a call to ministry. The Bible has a lot to say about the call to ministry. Reverend Heimbach has uh, read for us in our scripture reading um, the call of a young man by the name of Samuel. In the Old Testament, you would read of the call of the prophet Isaiah. You, read, you would read of the call of the prophet Ezekiel. In the New Testament, in the book of Galatians chapter 1, you would read the call of Saul of Tarsus. You could go throughout various Old and New Testament scriptures and read a call from God to a specific individual. I want to look at another one today. For a few minutes, we're going to consider the prophet Jeremiah. I'm looking at chapter 1 of the prophecy of Jeremiah. And we're going to read the first 10 verses. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priest who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It also came in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the exile of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Alas, Lord God, behold, I don't know how to speak because I'm a youth. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am a youth, because everywhere I send you, you shall go. And all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow, to build, and to plant. The call of Jeremiah... Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. 
The office of the prophet was a great and honorable office in both the Old and New Testament. God, in his eternal wisdom, for the proper functioning of the people of God, devised two main human voices to be the leader of the people of Israel. A king. Now, originally, they were to have no king. You remember, they're the people of God. But the people wanted to be like everybody else until finally God said, okay, you can have a king. And the king was to be God's representative on earth to rule rightly, to uh, exhibit godliness. The king was to be God's representative on earth. To supplement the ministry of a righteous king, God instituted the office of a prophet. The prophet, by simple definition, was a man who lent God his mouth. He spoke God's word. And while the king ruled in civil matters, it was the prophet of God who talked about the law of God, the righteousness of God. The social justice demanded by God. And so, properly working, king and prophet, working together, would hold the people of Israel according to God's holy plan. Now, you'll recall, after three kings of the United Kingdom, Saul, David, and Solomon, that at the death of Solomon, the United Kingdom broke up into the Northern Kingdom, ten tribes of Israel, the Southern Kingdom, the tribe of Judah and little Benjamin. That's the history of the divided kingdom. Now, if you read the history of this divided kingdom in kings and in chronicles, you will find that from God's evaluation, the northern kingdom never had a righteous king. In their 250 years of existence, until finally in 722 B.C., Sennacherib and the Assyrian army just came down, destroyed the capital city of Samaria, and the ten northern tribes of Israel were swallowed up in Assyria. Now, the king may have had some cultural advancements, may have had some military victories, but from God's perspective... Not one king served God. There was not one righteous king. Prophets tried to talk to the kings of the northern kingdom. Prophets tried to faithfully minister. But the king refused to hear them. Now we come to the southern kingdom. The southern kingdom, if, as you read Chronicles and Kings, they had a mixture of kings who did right in the sight of God and kings who did wrong in the sight of God. And prophets would try to speak to the kings, hold them accountable to the law of God. Jeremiah is one such example. Now, the prophets 
the writing prophets of the Old Testament give us an account of the prophet side of this king prophet tantrum. The prophets writing tell us about the prophets work working with these kings. The prophets as they write their literature have an historical inscription. Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 give, give us the historical parameters of one Jeremiah. Three kings are mentioned. Three kings are messing. The word of the Lord came in the days, verse 2, of Josiah. Verse 3, also in the days of Jehoiakim and Zedekiah. Now, truth, there were five kings. Josiah, Jehoiakim, Zedekiah. They served for a number of years. There were two other kings that served three months each and were either deposed or assassinated. Jehoiachin and Jehoahaz. So there were five kings. Jeremiah is a man who lends God his mouth and speaks, thus says the Lord, to the most crucial period of the southern kingdom. Five last kings. After these five, Babylonian exile. The first king was King Josiah. The scripture is going to tell us that King Josiah became king at age eight. Obviously at age eight he had some advisors and some people to help him rule. But at age eight, the last righteous king of the southern kingdom comes to the throne. Thirteen years later, the word of the Lord comes to Jeremiah. So now Josiah is 21. And God tells Jeremiah, I have called you to come along beside King Josiah to help these people. Turn to God and we stay the hand of the devourer known as the Babylonian army. Oh God, I can't do that. I can't talk. I'm a youth. Now the Hebrew word doesn't mean I'm a baby. It doesn't even mean I'm a five or six, seven year old toddler. Um... The word translated youth here is um, for someone 17, 18 years old in that age group. I can't talk. I can't advise. I'm just 18 years old. Jewish history. Jewish men 30 years and older talk. 18-year-old kids listen. I can't talk. I'm not old enough. And yet, the call of God comes upon an 18-year-old boy and says, don't tell me you can't talk. I have known you before you were even born. I knew you when you were in your mother's womb. I have consecrated you to this special mission. Don't tell me, Jeremiah, that you can't talk. 
Don't tell me you're just a youth. You have been appointed to this ministry. It's almost, it's almost, jump? How high? You want me to jump, God? How high? You have been appointed, you have been called to this special function in life, to be the spiritual advisor to a 21-year-old king by the name of Josiah. Jeremiah's ministry is a, a rather lengthy ministry. It runs from 627 to 586 B.C. We know Jeremiah as the weeping prophet. Now, for one thing, he weeps over the devastation of his beloved city, Jerusalem. But on a more personal level, he weeps because he speaks and no one listens to him. He cries out, no one turns ahead. He speaks, and all he gets is derision, heartache, and sadness. In fact, there's going to come a point in his life where Jeremiah says, no more. Now the word of the Lord comes, and I speak. But the next time the word of the Lord comes to me, I'm not going to speak. And it burns inside. It burns with a holy fire. Until. You're not going to like this, but thus says the Lord. And here comes the message of the prophet Jeremiah. King Josiah, the last righteous king of the southern kingdom, ruled from 640 to 609. After 609, he was followed by four kings in succession. Each of them did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so Jeremiah's ministry can really be divided between 627 and 609. Some happy years of ministry. His examples of early preaching in the prophecy Jeremiah call for repentance. There's still opportunity to turn back to God. But after 609... Four successive kings who do evil in the sight of the Lord. Jeremiah only got a message. Submit to the Babylonian army. You'll at least get out of that with your life. He doesn't offer them repentance. He doesn't offer them hope. It's judgment followed by message of judgment, followed by yet another message of judgment. And from 609 to 586, at the personal level, the prophet wept as he poured out his heart to the people. Why do you do it, Jeremiah? Why do you do it? I do it for the simple reason I was called. And woe is me if I don't do the bidding of that call. That's the only reason I'm doing this. That's the only reason I'm putting up with what I'm putting up. That's the only reason I'm facing the opposition that I'm facing. Jeremiah would say, I am called. And so, I have three quick things to say in relationship 
to a call. Jeremiah, I've called you to ministry. Oh, I can't do it. I'm just a you. No, you shall go. Sort of jump how high kind of a thing. You shall go. But, in verses 1 through 10, there are three accompanying thoughts. You shall go, first of all, with the conviction of his call. Jeremiah, you can't get away from this. In verse 5, in verse 10, I have appointed you. That's a strong word. Appointed you. You can't walk away from it. You can't give up on it. And if there's anything that I could wish to give our ordinance today, it's this simple thing. I hope you have the conviction of your personal call to ministry. Over the years, I have sat in ordination board minutes, meetings. General Superintendent Robert Klein would look at a potential ordinance and ask this basic question. Could you do anything else in life and still get to heaven? And the answer he was wanting, and he often got, was no. If I sold insurance, if I became a car salesman, if I did anything else, I would be going against God's basic call in my life. You shall go, Jeremiah. Don't tell me you can't go. You shall go. I have appointed you. And Jeremiah, at the age of 18, starts off on a 40-year ministry with the conviction, I'm called. To do what I'm going to do. With the conviction of his call. Well there's a second thing that I find here. You shall go Jeremiah. Don't tell me you can't do this. You shall go with the confidence of his message. Story is told of former General Superintendent Willard Kozad. General headquarters was then on East Ohio Street, across from our first church. General Superintendent Kozad got a letter from a young pastor. If you can remember the property on East Ohio Street, the Advocate Book Room was uh, right there on the corner. The letter from the young pastor said this, Dear Reverend Kozat, I have been pastoring for two years. I have preached anything and everything I can think of to preach. Would you go to the Advocate Book Room Purchase me a book and send it to me. General Superintendent Kozad went to Advocate Book Room and bought him a Bible. <laughs> bought him a Bible. When I was in seminary, the chaplain of Worcester College came to speak at the seminary for convocation or some such occasion. It was during the height of the Vietnam War. And the chaplain of Worcester College spoke every Sunday morning to a college group. 
And he looked at us with a straight face and said, I get my Sunday morning sermons out of Time magazine. And I thought, what a waste of seminary training. I could read Time magazine without three years of seminary study. Preach the word with the confidence that I have been called to ministry. Go with the confidence of his message. Preach the word. In verse 9, we have this beautiful phrase, similar to the prophecy of Isaiah. The Lord stretched out his hand, touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And if ever there was a day where the church of Jesus Christ needs a strong prophetic voice declaring the clear word of God, we are living in such a day as that today. Preach the word. Be confident of the word. The word of God goes forth sharper than a two-edged sword. It's a mirror that will reflect us in the light of that word. It's a hammer that will break us with conviction. God's word will never return to him void. It will accomplish the purpose that God has for it. Preach the word. You shall go, Jeremiah, with the conviction of a call with the confidence of a message. But there's a third thing. You will go, Jeremiah, with the consolation of his presence. Now I wish, I wish I could guarantee each of these ordinances that in the coming years, you will be the best liked person in your community. People will speak well of you. People will seek you out for words of wisdom. Never would be heard a discouraging word. And the sky is not cloudy all day. I wish I could tell you that. But the truth of the word of God is you may end up the lone voice crying in the wilderness. And the closer we get to the end time, the more and more are we to be assured that people are not going to stand for strong preaching. And you may feel all alone. You may feel everyone else is against me. But know this. He who has called you to ministry. Is going to stay with you to the very end. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today, bright hope for tomorrow. Great is your faithfulness, Lord, unto me. We used to sing, I'd rather have Jesus than anything. The presence of God. The very presence of God is enough to keep you and I on the battlefront. It's enough to keep us going. 
Now, verse 10 tells us a little bit of foreboding news. I've appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms. Notice the plural. And then we have six verbs. To pluck up, to break down, to destroy, and to overthrow, to build, and to plant. Four of those six verbs are bad news. Francis Schaeffer, in his book, The Church at the End of the 20th Century, says that preaching in the 21st century is going to demand 25 minutes of bad news before you can give five minutes of good news. And I believe that's right. I believe that's right. And people aren't going to like bad news. And people aren't going to support bad news. And you're going to find yourself, I am the only one crying out for righteousness and justice and holiness and goodness. But be assured of this. He that has called you to ministry is going to be right there with you. The most important thing is to have a call into a ministry such as this. You shall go with the conviction of his call, with the confidence of his message, and with the consolation of his presence. May God bless you. These ordinands have heard God call their name, and they have answered that call. Now they are to be ordained by the Churches of Christ and Christian Union. As these persons are ordained by God and the Church for the ministry to which we believe that they have been called by the Holy Spirit, I encourage you, Church, to pray for them. Our first one that we are going to ordinate to, to give ordination to today is Nick Adams. Nick and Ashley, if you would come. I know that they have been called by God and we are ordaining them for the purpose of service into the Churches of Christ and Christian Union. And Nick and Ashley, we appreciate you so much. And so today, Nick, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, preach the word, watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry, take authority to administer the sacraments. And now by the authority invest, invested in me as General Superintendent of the Churches of Christ and Christian Union, I ordain you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Congratulations. God bless you.
Daniel M. Coy and Joyce. Janice. Bless you. Make you. Thank you for making the trip today. God bless you. Dan, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the word, watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry, take authority to administer the sacraments, and now by the authority vested in me as the general superintendent of the churches of Christ and Christian Union, I ordain you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And God bless you. Congratulations. Aaron Long and his wife Chrissy. Aaron, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the word, watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of your ministry. Take authority to administer the sacraments, and now by the authority vested in me as the general superintendent of the Churches of Christ and Christian Union, I ordain you in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Deborah Seymour McKay and Tom. Okay, okay. You can sit, yes. Debbie, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the word, to watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist make full proof of your ministry take authority to administer the sacraments and now by the authority vested in me as the general superintendent of the churches of christ and christian union i ordain you in the name of the father and of the son and the holy spirit amen congratulations god bless you Joseph L. McCune and wife Tracy. God bless you, folks. Thrilled to have you today. God bless you. Joe, today I charge you before God in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ to preach the word. Watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist make full proof of your ministry take authority to administer the sacraments and now by the authority vested in me as the general superintendent of the churches of christ and christian union i ordain you in the name of the father and of the son and the holy spirit amen amen god bless you congratulations Crystal A. Spriggs. Amen. God bless you, Crystal. Bless you, Phil. Crystal, today I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach the word. 
Watch in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of your ministry. Take authority to administer the sacraments. And now, by the authority vested in me as the General Superintendent of the Churches of Christ and Christian Union, I ordain you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. There you go. You can put that beside his. I'd like to, at this time, if you are a family member or someone who came in support of any of the one of the six that were just ordained, would you please stand so that we could recognize you today as family and friends? Very good. You may be seated. We also have then three individuals who are transferring from other denominations or organizations to be received into our denominational fellowship today and at this time we would like to invite them to come along with their spouse if that if they have a spouse with them today so that they may be recognized David E Colgrove just have them all get it and stand up here Hi, Dave. God bless you my friend we just mind standing right over here and stay up Anthony Dell. God bless you, folks. If you'll just stay right here with that distance, but stay right there. God bless you. Appreciate it. John Benjamin Kendrew the Third and Melanie. face the congregation, Dave Colgrove, Anthony Dell, and his wife, Michelle, Ben, and Melanie Kendrew, and uh, we are delighted to receive them here as members of our denominational fellowship. Any that may have come in support of these that are transferring, if you would stand at this time so that we could also recognize you and their support. Have some gifts here. I have that for you as well, and that for you. That no, this is That's black as his. I've got color coordination here. <laughs> there we go. Now we all have the right colors. All right. Back up. Yeah. Would you just stay here for a moment and let's have a prayer for you, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all these have been ordained and for these transfers as well. They've been ordained other places and they have sensed the call to be a part of the Churches of Christ and Christian Union. We're so grateful for that. And Lord, we just uh, thank them for doing that and being obedient to your word, but we want them to feel like family. And so Lord, I just thank you for these ordinands. I thank you for these transfers that, Father, we will together build your kingdom, see many people saved, many lives changed, many communities, Lord Jesus, that will catch fire and that will reach many people for the God, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And more than anything else, would you be uplifted, would you be glorified by each act that we do together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Just a sec.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's my joy to present to you the 2020 ordination class of the Churches of Christ and Christian Union. Would you just show your appreciation to each and every one of them? Amen. And will you do your best to remember them in prayer and to do your best to support your pastor and uh, your minister uh, in the days ahead? Um, At the end here, if you would like to give to Mount of Praise, if you go out the side doors, there's buckets available, and you can give to the Mount of Praise and uh, for this service as well. Thank you so much for being here, and I know it means a lot to these ordinands. You mean a lot to us. And I don't say that just to be saying something. We're proud of you. We truly are. We're grateful for the call that God has put on your heart and in your life. And I want you to know this. We need you. We need you. And thank you for being a part of our ministry. Thank you for being a part of the Churches of Christ Christian Union. But more than that, thank you for being a part of the kingdom of God. And God bless you today. stand together. Father, this has been a special day in the lives of these ordinance, in the lives of these spouses, Father. It's been a special day for the Churches of Christ in Christian Union. And Lord, we're thankful that uh, men and women are still answering the call. Lord, we're thankful for the message that we heard today of the importance of the call and the promises associated with that call. Lord, we recognize that there will be times in ministry, Father, then the call will be the thing that will continue to hold us fast to the task that you've placed before us. And so, Lord, I pray for these uh, individuals here today, Father, these candidates today. And, God, I pray for their ministries, that Lord, that you will bless them abundantly. Lord, we we just believe you to do that. You said, ask and we shall receive it, Father. And Lord, there's no greater work. There's no greater knowing of being in the will of our Heavenly Father than the doing the work of ministry, Father. And Lord, may there be fruit for their labor. Father, we pray for their families, Lord, because we recognize the need of support. And Lord, we pray for them as well, that God, you will minister to their hearts. And Lord, you will guide them as they support that one who's called and Lord we pray Father for for their lives and their children Father if that be the case God you will just bless them abundantly the churches that they minister to Lord may there be an outpouring of your spirit may there be a fruit for their labor O God and may your kingdom be built through the efforts of these again Lord we stand humbly before you recognizing the greatness of of the call, Lord. And Lord, we're just so thankful for these who have answered. Bless them, we pray, and give them fruit for their labor in the days to come. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Of ten thousand 